And what they were saying by laying down uh, their outer garments symbolizing their identity was, Jesus, you're not just king of Jerusalem. You're not just king of the world, but you're my king. I worship you. I praise you. And as they praise, what do they sing? Glory to God. Peace on earth. Does this sound familiar? This is the song of the angels from Luke chapter 2. Easter's kind of early this year, isn't it? Seems like we just had Christmas. And so I'm sure you remember the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 being read. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And here now, just as when Jesus came for the first time, the angels sang this song. And now, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, at the close of his life, the people are singing the same song. When they saw the crowds and heard the praises, the powerful religious folk said to him, in verse 39, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Rabbi, control the crowds. Tell them to be quiet. Enough is enough. But the people praising Jesus could not be contained. In fact, Jesus said to the critics, if the people stop praising me, the rocks and stones themselves will sing. Like that first Palm Sunday, this Palm Sunday is a day for praising Jesus. And so if if you stand there with your arms folded and fail to praise him, Someone else will. And if no one else praises him, well, maybe, since we don't have any stones here, maybe these brick walls will begin to cry out. The point is, Jesus came to Jerusalem to say, your life and my life are worth saving. And what Jesus rode into Jerusalem to do for us surely merits our praise. And so I encourage you, don't leave it to the bricks today. Throw down your coat, as it were. Open your heart to the king who rode into Jerusalem to give his life for yours and for mine. Jesus' love was uncontainable. His grace, immeasurable. And his mission to ride into Jerusalem to give his life for yours and for mine was unstoppable. And so as I wrap this up, let's go back to the original question. What is a life worth? What is your life worth? Jesus came to Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday to answer that question. He sent his disciples to find a ritually pure cult, symbolizing the sanctity of his motives. He rode into the the city on a humble beast, to make a dramatic statement that that holy city and everyone in it, indeed the whole world and all its people, are worth everything to God. Jesus said to that city and to this one as well, you are worth everything to God. And so Jesus rode into Jerusalem knowing that the city would be his death chamber. I want to invite you to come on Thursday evening. You know, when Jesus had his last supper with his disciples, they ate a meal together. And then they celebrated the Passover. And Jesus said, this is my body, this is for blood, this is my blood. And, and then in the early church, whenever they celebrated the Lord's Supper, guess what they did? They ate together. And then they sang some songs and prayed. And they shared communion together. I encourage you to come Thursday night, especially this Thursday night to celebrate the Lord's Supper around tables with your fellow Christians. I encourage you to come next Sunday and bring a friend as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus could have remained safely in the peaceful green hills of Galilee. His friends surely would have understood if he had stayed away from Jerusalem just this one Passover because of the extreme danger. But Jesus was on a mission, and he would not be deterred. He could not be stopped from entering Jerusalem to finish his work because his mission was to give his life away. And so to answer that question, what is your life worth? 
The answer is this. Your life is worth everything to God. Jesus, by his Palm Sunday action, stoked a divided response. On the one hand, the powerful who said, Rabbi, keep your people in line so we can hold on to our life, power, authority, control. On the other side of it, he provoked a response among people who threw down their coats and said, Hosanna, you are my king. A wise older preacher once said to me, Ted, in whatever church you pastor, you'll get two kinds of responses. You'll find that there are some people who come to church, but yet they're not really ready to let go of power, authority, and control over themselves and over others, and yes, even over the church, including the two biggies, worship and money. He said this to me. I was, I was stunned. I'm like, what do you mean? You, you mean, you mean that there are people who come to church who are not ready to let go of their life, who are not great, yet ready to let go of control? He said, yeah. But keep preaching the word. Keep praying, and the Holy Spirit will come, and people whose grasp is tight will begin to loosen their grasp will begin to open their hands and open their hearts to the Holy Spirit. Jesus let go of his life for you. Are you ready to let go of your life and release it to him? Are you trying to grip your life so tightly that your knuckles are turning white? Release the pressure and let go. And let your life go to God the way Jesus let his life go for you. As we close this service, offering our prayers, gifts, and praise to God, I invite you to unfold your arms and to relax your grip on life and open your hands and hearts to Jesus, who gave everything for you and for me. What can heal the wounded soul? What can make us white as snow? What can fill the emptiness? What can mend our brokenness? Brokenness. Mighty, awesome, wonderful is the holy cross where the lamb laid down his life to lift us from the fall mighty is the power of restores our faith in God what reveals the Father's love what can lead the wayward home what can melt a heart of stone what can free the guilty ones what can save and overcome overcome 